We all have another question over here. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Kathleen Matthews. I'm with Marriott International, the uh, global hotel company, which has about 140 hotels in Asia Pacific, many here in the ASEAN region, and hopefully one very soon in uh, Myanmar. Um, you've talked a lot about the movement of goods and money, um, but not so much about the movement of people. And um, working with the Minister of Tourism from Indonesia, Mary Ellen Pengestu, um, we have been talking here at the World Economic Forum about a um, visa-free travel agreement within the ASEAN countries to make this almost like a Schengen visa region. Um, could some of you talk about um, the, uh, how we start to get travel in the trade discussions? Because the movement of people certainly facilitates the banking and the credit opportunities uh, that would follow to make that travel easier, as well as um, travel between countries being an export for the country that has those receipt of visitors. Thank you, Kathleen. Excellent question. And Serge, I happen to know that this is a subject close to your heart, too. I'm not a government official, so I don't represent uh, the policy. No, I claim to know exactly what the reasons are, but as a frequent traveler myself, I can only offer some observations. This goes back to exactly what I said about unequal strengths. People ask me, why can a Singaporean go to Indonesia without a visa, go to Vietnam without a visa, and when they come to Myanmar, they need a visa. And the blame is on Myanmar being tough. I think the truth is, the Singapore government would be very concerned, and I would be the same, if there was no visa requirements between Singapore and Myanmar. You would have 200,000 Myanmar people flying into Singapore if 20,000 disappear and never tell people where they end up. It would be a big headache for Singapore. So when Singapore says, sorry, you have to have a visa to come to Singapore, what do you expect Myanmar to say? You also will have to have a visa to come to my country. And that is why you have this situation, even on travel visas, and inequality between the ASEAN countries. How do you solve that? Let me uh, maybe kick that out to Kishore for a brief uh, reply. Do you have any ideas as to why this is still the case? No. I should make one point about ASEAN, so, so, so that everyone understands the nature of the beast we're dealing with. It is not an organization like the European Union that moves forward in this straightforward, legalistic fashion, step by step. I always compare the movements of ASEAN to a crab. It takes two steps forward, one step backwards, one step sideways. And if you look at it from the short from the short term point of view, you see chaos in the movements. But if you look at ASEAN, you slice its progress decade by decade by decade, you can see the significant progress. And just to take travel, okay? Briefly. Which is the which is the critical thing. Let me give you one statistic about the middle class in Asia, all of Asia, so you understand what the potential is for travel. The total size of the middle class in Asia, but I'm talking all of Asia, South Asia to East Asia today is five hundred million people. Now, by 2020, which is only seven years from now, that number is going to explode from 500 million to 1.75 billion, an increase of three and a half times in seven years. I guarantee you, I'll take bets with any of you, that the number of tourists in this region are just going to explode visa or no visa. And by the way, the Chinese, require visas to come to Southeast Asia. There will be at least 200 million Chinese coming to China, Southeast Asia with visas. Why? Because the potential, the, 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 the capacity of the people in this region, the disposable income that they will have to travel is going to grow by leaps and bounds. And that's why tourism will grow. Minister, in 30 seconds or fewer, could you commit to making travel and visa-free travel part of the trade discussion? It has been uh, a topic that we've always discussed at uh, the ASEAN economic ministers' meetings, not as regularly as trade and investment and all the other economic elements. Uh, but this is something, look, like Kishore, coming from ASEAN, 
uh, I've also been a study and a student of gradualism. And this, this I think, uh, is an, imp an important thing to note that, yes, we may move at snail space, but we get it done. If we take a look at the posture and the portrait of ASEAN where it is today, vis-a-vis -vis where we were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we're completely different. Yes, we take things one step at a time. We, we may move back half a step, but this is going to get done. And I, I, I can, well, I'm not going to guarantee the way Kishore uh, does, but uh, this is something that's going to be taken a view of right. in due time. Thank you. Jaspal, it seems that your money can get to places before you can. I mean, not you personally, but the individual traveler. Do you, force, uh, do you see this, a similar issue, uh, before we take the next question, on you know, that, that banking in itself might also benefit from freer movement of people, not just money? Well, clearly, it's been proven over and over again that as you have free movement of goods, services, capital, people, uh, you have uh, an economic uh, benefit uh, out of that. The only other point I would make is that uh, you know, we can look at the disparities between the countries, as I started saying earlier, but uh, it's also the complementarity. So it is a complement, you know, you need to have in any block, uh, if you had everybody even, it could be as challenging, uh, to Serge's point, as having people who want to catch up. And as there has to be an aspiration. And I think uh, just like as Singapore will aspire to have the low-cost labor of Myanmar, so will Myanmar citizens aspire to have the lifestyle and sophistication of Singapore. So I think uh, in some ways the disparity in itself leads to a more successful recipe uh, for a block. 